Hello ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, uh, we're doing this uh, Voice of Yamato live on Twitch because it's more interactive, I'm on my own. Uh, this is Voice of Yamato number 50, uh, which is a pretty big milestone. I'm happy uh, that I stuck with it. I'm happy that I have a piece of content that I can call my own. I am uh, very, very proud of a lot of the episodes that we've made and I'm proud of my own personal progression in terms of how they are being delivered. Uh, but I'm uh, the most grateful that I have a lot of fun doing them and uh, convincing uh, the homies uh, to uh, get in there isn't uh, the biggest challenge, you know? Uh, the last one episode was with Wunder, uh, that was episode 49, and I think that was a splendid episode. A lot of things that we covered, uh, G2 2019, his year on Fnatic, you know, this year was quite terminus for uh, Wunder, of course. Uh, it's been, you know, uh, quite a career that Dunder has had, you know? Uh, I wanted to cover a, a wide variety of topics today. Uh, I think uh, the best place to start, because it is so damn fresh, is KCX. So I was at KCX, uh, I was at KCX uh, last weekend, and honestly, it blew my mind. It, it, it really, really blew my mind. And that comes from a person that has been to, to, to multiple uh, events and the multiple, uh, you know, large arena settings, uh, you know. I think that um, KCX truly, truly delivered on all of the hype. You know, sometimes as a person that... Uh, you know, has followed K-Corp for um, 10 years, and not 10 years, sorry, the whole year, not 10 years, uh, the whole year, you know, he's had the K-Corp fans, you know, the K-Corp fans were always talking about how amazing KCX is, how amazing the live fan uh, experience is, uh, they were always talking about how Saken's going to pop off when it comes to EMA Masters, uh, you know, it seems like the K-Corp fans, they weren't exaggerating. I'm so used to fan base ex exaggerating and um, all of these separate experiences really, really delivered. So my journey, you, I had this issue where I lost my passport. I lost my passport, right, uh, on my flight back from Montpellier and uh, I had to cancel my flights. I ha was planning to go to KCX and... Um, I wanted to uh, make it as a surprise a little bit more, but uh, eventually I just said, yo, uh, I can't make it because I have no passport and my ID has expired. Uh, and then we got the idea of uh, taking a train. So I took a train. Well, I tried to take a train. Uh, I wanted to be there as early as possible. Uh, I wanted to show up early to figure out like some, some business dealings and to make sure that I can have... Uh, a nice meal and relax and make sure that I make it to the venue uh, on good time. I had a train that would uh, make me arrive at 10 uh, from Dortmund. And it's a bit of a drive for me to make it to Dortmund. Uh, I was uh, very, very fortunate that uh, my girlfriend's father uh, offered to drive. You know, it was super, super good, super, super cool. He drove me. Uh, I was there 30 minutes ahead, like I was there a solid hour ahead of time. I decided to eat some McDonald's. You know, McDonald's at 4 a.m. You got some crackheads, crackheads there for sure, you know. So I was eating my, I ordered a fry, a chicken, a McChicken burger, you know, those, those small ones, a little a cheeseburger, six nuggets. I got the full, uh, you know, the full uh, McDonald's experience, you know. I got my fries, tastes like garbage as always. I thought this is going to be the perfect way to start my journey. I'm going to eat this McDonald's and then go to sleep and sleep the whole train ride because, you know, I stayed up all the way till uh, 3 a.m. and then I started my journey. So I make it uh, to uh, the Gleis, you know, to the platform. And uh, basically, I see the train. Uh, I can enter the train. I'm looking at the time. I'm there 20 minutes ahead. Uh, it says on the board, uh, 5.18 is not going to leave. It's super, super good. So I'm there in Dortmund. I'm there at Dortmund Hub Bahnhof. I go to the platform, and then all of a sudden, the doors close. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, the doors close, maybe they don't want to, you know, get all this crackhead McDonald's air into uh, the nice train. 
Uh, but then eventually the train starts moving. And this is 20 minutes ahead of scheduled departure. 20 minutes ahead of scheduled departure. And it starts moving. And I'm not alone on the platform. There's other people. Other people there, standing there, thinking to themselves, okay, uh, what are we doing? What's happening? Uh, you know, in my mind, in my mind, I'm thinking my copium uh, hits and say, oh, maybe they're just doing a little uh, drive around the coming back. Maybe they're fixing something with the train. They're just going to do a little loop. Uh, no. So I wait there for 20 minutes. And then eventually the 518 train that says on that, you know, that uh, image uh, that shows the next coming train and when it arrives, it just switches it to, to the next train. And I'm thinking to say, okay, so I am screwed. I am completely screwed. So I begin to think, you know, how do I make it to Paris? So I was looking at maps. I was looking at, you know, ways to make it to Paris. And I figured if I make it to Brussels, if I make it to Brussels, I'll be able to make it to Paris through a bus, through a train, some kind of way I will make it to Paris if I make it to Brussels. So I figured out this train path with the help of the Deutsche Bahn app. And I have to pay like a 200 euro, you know, for this train path pattern uh, path and i go from basically dortmund to stuttgart from stuttgart to Köln, and then from Köln to brussels and in this time span you know the biggest struggle was you know i'm, I'm an experienced train rider no problem and the biggest struggle was that i hadn't slept yet i hadn't slept yet so my biggest challenge was staying awake for the stop that i needed to go off on because things kept going Things just kept going, right? So I made these alarms. I made uh, a shit ton of alarms. And I was lucky that at one stop, this lady next to me heard my alarm and realized I was not waking up because I was like on demon hours, you know? And she's like, hello, hello, alarm. And I'm like, all right, thank you. I have to leave. <laughs> and then I leave in Köln. I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's like a solid eight, nine in the morning, and I haven't slept at all besides these micro-sleeps that I'm getting in this in this train ride, right? Besides these micro-sleeps, I am not getting any, any sleep. I will show you guys uh, this picture that I have, all right? This picture. So basically, basically this picture, can I just, where, where, I, where is it? Screenshots. So basically, I don't know if you guys can see it, but this is my arrow ring that tracks my sleep. So it's like it, it tracked a little nap that I got uh, on the way to Brussels from Köln. So basically, uh, I, this was the nap that I got. This was my sleep on the day of KCX. So finally, I arrived to Brussels. I go to I go to Thales, right? I go I go to the to the to the station because I don't want to spend money. I check the trains and basically the only thing that is available is first class. And I'm like, shit, man. I already spent 400 euro on a fl flight that is non-refundable. I've already spent 400 euro on t train tickets and 100 euro on the hotel. Like I'm going bankrupt going to KCX, man. I am going completely completely bankrupt. Nevertheless, right? I continue I continue I walk up to uh, the Paris train. It's 10, basically, it's like, it's 10 minutes until this train to Paris leaves. And I walk up to them. I'm like, yo, homies, I have this ticket from Dortmund to Paris. This is me. This is what happened. This is the video of my train leaving right in front of me, right? So I showed them this video. Showed them this video. Show them this video, right? You guys can see it. This train just starts fucking piecing out. It just starts piecing out in front of me. And then at the end, I'm showing the time. I just pieces out. That's Paris, Paris Nord, you know, you see it. And then I show the time there. It's quite small, so you don't see it. And I explained to them, yo, I, I, I got griefed, you know? I got completely griefed. The train uh, left pretty much... I don't know if you see, uh, uh, you see, you don't see it too well, right? But it left 20 minutes ahead of the time. And this is a picture of, of course, you know, the information on the Gleis, which is the platform in German. This was my meal at McDonald's. You see my nugget there? My little chicken nugget. I got that sauce. 
You know, I'm, I'm in the middle of a crack den, you know? Crack den McDonald's. That's what's up. No burgers. Yeah, I, I have a, I had a, I had a... That's a, that's a chicken burger. The one that I slapped a little bit. I got that iced tea. Nevertheless, we arrived, you know? We arrived. I arrived on uh, location. Uh, I was uh, very, very happy to have made it. Uh, everybody wrote to me on Twitter, you have to leave uh, Garden Node as soon as possible. It's dangerous. I didn't get that impression. Bro, I even, I even saw this orchestra. Let me show you guys this orchestra. I filmed this orchestra. I saw this orchestra. I don't know if you guys see this. I'm gonna... I saw this orchestra. They're just playing music in the middle of the train station, man. Just music like that, man. They're pretty... was pretty neat. But once again, I hadn't slept. I figured, okay, I'm gonna make it to the hotel and see if I can check in already. And the funniest thing, you know, after me reading the messages about Garden Note, I went to the hotel and this lady was asking, where, where can I buy groceries? And basically, the woman in the hotel, she said, this place is shit. <laughs> you shouldn't be here. <laughs> and I thought it was so fucking funny because, like, basically... She like paused because she had to think about what to say in English, you know? And in the most French accent, she was like, this place is a shit. <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> lovely. I was fucking laughing my ass off. And I, I checked in, the hotel was like a, it was a prison room, guys. Like the hotel that I booked, it was a prison room. I'm not gonna lie. Let me show you. Like it was, it was, it was a prison room. Like let's let's be honest, it was a little prison room. This was all that was was to it. It was a little prison room. Um, I I walked around basically. I figured, okay, I don't have time to sleep. It's like my body is not really like I I I feel tired as fuck, but my body doesn't feel ready to sleep at twelve. I could have taken maybe a two hour nap, but I figured I need a goal for myself, and then I will just walk. Uh, so I found this uh, Adidas original store. I walked for 40 minutes. I walked for 40 minutes there and uh, I checked out the store. I was thinking maybe I can get a new fresh tracksuit uh, for uh, the event. Didn't find anything that fits. I don't know what, what's going on with that Adidas original store, but they only had like these, you know, uh, you know, the Bee Gees, the musicians, the Bee Gees, the, the sadly have passed away. You know, you can tell by the way I use my walk. You know, those guys, the Bee Gees. Uh, basically, they have these puffy ass pants. You know, they have these puffy ass pants. That's the Adidas originals uh, that they had. You know, staying alive, all that good stuff. Didn't buy a tracksuit, and then I had a meeting, but I was starving, so I went to this place. Um, uh, I had I went to this place called Le Jou, I think called Le Jou, because it had the highest rating. And I have to say, you know, the waiters there they were hitting on me, perma man, perma. Way too much. They were hitting on me so much, the waiters. Because basically, apparently, apparently this, 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 um, this restaurant is a gay hotspot. Which, you know, it is what it is. They had delicious food. I ate, I ate uh, salmon. I ate salmon, uh, salmon bread, salmon toast. It was, uh, it was lovely. It was lovely, but you know the the staring and the and the and the hitting on. You know I could have used a little bit less of that, but they are very very pleasant and polite to me. So it is what it is. You know they're very very delicious food, good ambiance. This was you know this was it was it was a great restaurant. I understand why this place had fantastic rating, fantastic rating. Nevertheless. I continued, I ate my meal, and then it was time, I was like, I'm not taking a cab. I'm not taking a cab in Paris, I'm not gonna spend more money. I am, I am completely, you know, I'm already done with money, so I'm gonna take the tram. I'm gonna take the tram, I go to the tram, my friend, right, my friend in Paris, he leaves me, he leaves me at this, uh, you know, uh, at the train. And I have to go in a specific direction. And I didn't realize that these, these lines have the same name and they move in opposite directions. 
So I'm sitting there on the train, right? I enter it, and I'm going in the wrong direction, man. I'm going in the wrong direction. I don't even realize. I go all the way to the other direction. All the way. I'm all the way at the end. I go to, like, I go all the way to the end. Let, let me let me re remind myself what the name is. Uh, line one in Paris. Yellow. So, I went to Chateau de Vincennes. Vincennes? I went all the way to the Chateau. And I was supposed to go to La Defense. And the place that I needed to go to was in the... In the <laughs> in the opposite direction. Nevertheless, I was on I was on the subway. I went I went the all, all the way. Boom. No worries, you know. I had my I had my Pokemon thing. I was catching Pokemon worldwide. Made sure to get gifts to uh, send to Alena. You know, I had to have that covered. Dira, thank you very much for the tier one. Nevertheless, I, I've, I've, as, I, as I'm in this train, I notice, you know, all of the K-Cop jerseys. You know, all the K-Cop jerseys, they're beginning to appear, you know. The K-Cop jerseys, some of them say hello to me. Most of them just on their own, you know. Uh, so many K-Cop jerseys are filling this fucking tram, dude. It's starting to get real, you know. Everything is starting to wake in. I, I have forgotten completely that I've slept for one hour, you know. One hour, I have slept one hour, I, I begin to forget this completely. You know, I ate the salmon sandwich. I, I, it was good. It was good. I see the K-Cop jerseys. I see a little sucking. I see a little cabochard. I see everything, you know, appearing in front of me. We go off on La Defense. And at La Defense, bro, even more K-Cop jerseys. Holy moly. I go up the stairs. Boom. Even more K-Cop jerseys, man. Let me show you this video that I took. Which was absolutely mental i don't know if you guys can see this but basically this line stretched for a, at least a solid kilometer fantastic fantastic it was crazy and i was there you know i was walking because i knew i had vip tickets man i had vip tickets i said I, I, you know the guards were like oh uh, uh sir where are you going i say sir i have a vip ticket and then he said oh okay this way sir and I said, merci beaucoup. And then I'm walking. Battle cruiser operation. This, exactly, this is how I'm walking. I'm so smug, you know. I'm so smug. I'm walking, you know. I'm walking like, you know, you know how, how bed bugs, they walk away after sucking your blood? That's how, I, that's how I'm walking. I'm walking. I wave to some of the homies, you know. And then I finally make it to entrance 21. Golden letters. VIP, baby. Boom. Whew. It's good. I meet my homie Samish. I remember that when he was in... Um, there was this org. There was this org back... Like, I knew him from, like, season two. Samish. And my man's still busy. You know, I love to see esports faces that have managed to keep busy as long as I have. Because then it feels like I'm not, you know, a dying breed. You know, I'm not the dinosaur. And then when I'm there at the 21 thing, you know, fans begin to gather, we take pictures, you know, it's pleasant, it's nice, you know, it's cool. I have a chat with Samish, some of the other homies, you know, some of the other, um, let's say, um, some of the other, you know, casters from, um, of course, uh, OTP and so forth. And uh, I enter, I show my ticket, and I see Viteo. I see Viteo, yo, how you feeling Viteo? I have a little chat, you know, good to see Viteo. You know, we were, I, I met him uh, when I was, um, of course, on, um, what's it called? Uh, PGL, you know, post-game lobby. It was sick, you know, good to meet Viteo, wished him good luck, you know. And then we moved up, I moved up in the VIP area, you know. Bro, KCX, don't fuck around, bro. Jacob, don't fuck around. I've been to many VIP areas, and I'm not saying that to, to show off in any shape or form, but... All VIPs are not the same. There's VIPs and you don't get shit. There's VIPs and you're just in a different separate area. No bonuses. For example, VIP, when it comes to um, the LEC, you know, when you're at the LEC, you get your own box. It's pretty cool. You get Kit Kats that you, you can eat, you know, Kit Kats for forever. Right? Which is cool, you know. 
But the VIP here, man, holy moly. The VIP at KCX, man. Endless champagne. Endless wine. Red, white, rosé. Endless water. Endless. Endless multivitamin juice. And then the snacks. Oi, 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 the snacks. Oi, 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 the snacks. I mingle around. You know, I realize that I'm in an environment. I don't know a lot of people, guys. I don't know a lot of people at all. This is like the whole French mafia was in the VIP room. I knew like nine people out of 300. I'm not going to lie. So I knew Niski. I knew Yusuf, which is Niski's brother. I knew... I got to know Noad, who is streaming together with Niski's brother. And I, of course, ran into Clement, who is um, currently the G GM, you know, the GM of, uh, of course, K Corp. He was the one who hooked me up. He hooked me up with the VIP uh, tickets. Clement, me, me and Clement, we go back. We worked together in Vitality back in 2018, you know, when we went to the World Championship. Clement La Para, yes. Uh, I really, really like Clement. Really like his dog too, Spoon. Spoon was a very, very nice dog. Always licked my feet during reviews, but it is what it is, you know? I sit down, you know? I don't want to bother people too much, you know? You know, people speaking English for my sake. You know, I'm here as a tourist. I'm here as a guest. I sit down and all of a sudden the show starts, man. The show starts, it unveils this stage. <sighs> The curtains fall, bro. The shit looked amazing. The curtains fall. Rea, you know, he goes up there and they do the classic, what is your color? All of the KCO players and coaching staff together on the stage to open up the event. What's the color? Boom. And then 28,000. Boo. Boo. Holy moly. Goosebumps. Ay, ay, ay. Goosebumps. It was delicious. Camito appears to the stage. Camito says amazing things. Amazing things in French, I'm sure. You know, everyone was gassed up. You know, you could see the emotion through his voice. I don't speak French, but I can read people. And he was really, really enjoying the moment, you know, and speaking good things uh, to the homies in the crowd. That was amazing. And then the follow up was the Rocket League event. And apparently, you know, I thought they brought in a boxing announcer, okay? I thought they brought in this boxing announcer. And then everybody on Twitter, you know, everybody on Twitter, they corrected me. This is Stax. And this guy is, you know, one of the homies from uh, the Rocket League. Woo! Wait, actually it was Valorant first. Sorry, it was Valorant first. Valorant was first, but Stax, the announcer from Rocket League, was announcing the teams. And shit was crazy. I liked how they gave, you know, extra time and space for the Keiko players to be announced. Because first they announced, here is T1 Valorant from the Pacific. Boom. And then they were introduced, they moved on stage. But Keiko, they introduced every single player one by one. Boom, boom, boom. It was masterclass. Masterclass. Nevertheless, the event continued. It was very, very good to, to, to meet the homies, you know. Um, I spent my time and I really, really, you know, reveled in um, everything that was going on. It was super, super cool. Uh, I had a good time. I met Stryker. I met Adam. You know, all of the French homies that I know, but most of the homies I didn't know. You know, I saw, uh, you know, some people that I knew from, from past days, but I didn't want to, like, involve myself too much because I am the guest there and I don't speak French and me forcing people to speak English, you know. I was a lot more in the distance. I met, of course, the KC players. Uh, I spoke to Targamas. I spoke to Saken. I spoke a lot with Cabo because we never really had a chance to, uh, to, to catch up. And it was good. It was sick. There was the halftime show with some artists that sadly I don't know. You know, I thought Caris would show up. I thought Ka Kalash Criminel is going to show up. I thought maybe Ziak, you know. Fix it, fix it, boom, boom, boom. I thought, I thought, you know, maybe, you know, I, I would actually, you know, connect with the music somehow. I was hoping. 
I um, am more of a drill person. Drill and trap is more uh, of my music. But let's be honest, my music taste doesn't matter in the context of that venue. And everybody, everybody, you know, was vibing uh, with the musician. I don't know him, uh, but everybody was vibing with the musician. So it is what it is. Super, super cool. Finally, you know, uh, finally we had uh, the, um, the League of Legends event. I co-streamed it. The vote is on my channel. It was super, super cool. Uh, Cabo was running it down. Crazy how hard he ran it down. You know, like he, he ran it down so hard. He ran it down so hard. He ran it down so hard, but I have the jersey he ran it down with because Cabo owed me a jersey. He ran it down with this jersey. <laughs> he ran it down with this one. Still haven't watched it. But they won. I think Targamas uh, on the pike, the support gap was, pfft, it was monstrous. Honestly, the biggest gap was in the roles where the team Eretics roster didn't have uh, <laughs> LSE players. It's like jungle gap was insane. Like, I don't know. Jungle gap was massive. Support gap was massive. Pike was flying. You know, I think that um, Targamas and um, Targamas and uh, Bruder, uh, what's his name? Of course, Synchrof, uh, they completely ran the game. So basically at that point, you know, when I was live streaming, I was like 12 champagnes in, 12 champagnes in, and I mentioned that they had food, but basically the only food was like cheesecake, creme brulee, chocolate brownie, and these small amuse bouche, you know, these small little treats. So I'm there on 12 champagnes, and I am on only chocolate cake diet, man. I am on the most cocktail diet that you've imagined. Trust me. And then the, the event wraps up, you know, it was cool. I got to set up in the room. I appreciate coming Cop so much because honestly, I asked him if I can co-stream. Uh, I, I asked him last minute, can I co-stream the, the event in uh, in the event, in the fucking event hall? And instantly, Cote and Clement, they instantly told me, we can hook you up. We're going we're gonna to try to figure this out. They put me in the green room with the players. And I was there setting up. The K-Cop roster, the coaches didn't mind at all. They were like, yo, you're cool. No problem. You're not bothering anything. I asked them, yo, should I leave the room? Uh, I can leave the room and I can set up after. No problem at all. They said, no, don't worry. It's okay. You're welcome here. And I appreciate that so much. And the setup they set up for me, bro, it's a better setup than the one I have at home. Better than the one I have at home, really. It was, it was fantastic. So I'm there. Very grateful. Really, really appreciative of how they have treated me. Clemo hooking me up with VIP. One hour sleep. 12 champagnes in. It was super, super good. You know? And we co-streamed the event. Yinsu Collins. They, um, uh, she raided us uh, after she co-streamed the Valorant part uh, with, with Boaster, of course. And uh, that was also super, super nice. And then when the event wrapped up, Clement told me, yo, uh, like we're going to the K-Cop office. And the K-Cop office, you know, it was super, super cool because there's only K-Cop people, man. Only K-Cop people. A couple of people from OTP too. Uh, but it was a very, very intimate environment and that was super cool too. I got to know Targamas a little bit deeper, you know. I got to see the office. You know, it's weird because I, I have seen the office so many times from the camera point of view. And some places look bigger than they are, and some places look smaller than they are. It was a very, very unique experience. I got to finally, I, um, I, I got to meet Kamito after he was busy. And Kamito, you know, it's crazy how, like, I've, I've interacted with Kamito in person three times. And every time he comes across as so, you know, polite, there is not a hint of arrogance at all to him. He, 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 there, there is... He's so genuine and, and human, you know? And for a person that just had 30,000 people, you know, share his name, you know? That context is fantastic, you know? And in these small interactions I've had with Kamito, you know that everything that he has, he has worked hard for it and he has deserved it, you know?
And I think that that sentiment echoes through the company and also through the fandom. So I, as a coach, you know, I've coached so long. I am an expert in reading people, you know? I'm an expert in 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 uh, in reading people. You can rewatch the KCX if you want. <laughs> Brother thinks I wasn't there. I'm I'm, I'm I'm literally talking about me being there, mate. <laughs> and it was amazing to to talk, you know, briefly with Camito. Every time gives uh, the, the the same impression. Uh, super super down to earth. Uh, I spoke with Kote too. Uh, what a legend Kote is. And. Um, Eventually, you know, it was time for me to leave. But then Niski said, yo, Niski said he ordered 20 pizzas. He ordered 20 pizzas, man. He ordered 20 pizzas. I was like, okay, I'm going to stay for the pizzas. I'm going to have to stay for the pizzas. I'm, gonna, I'm curious how they're going to deliver 20 pizzas. Because that's a project in itself. How are they going to deliver 20 pizzas? He's going to pay 200 euro for 20 pizzas. I shit you not. These pizzas were so delicious. After, after I have drank 12 champagnes and only eaten cheesecake and creme brulee, these pizzas really, 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 really hit the spot, man. Holy moly. And basically, it was time for me to leave. I begin to say bye. I say bye to Kalist. I say bye to the people that I know. And I'm polite. I say bye to the people that I've interacted with. Slowly, I'm making my exit, you know. It's like, it's time for me to, to leave. I grab the jersey from uh, from Cabo and uh, I say my goodbyes and then I walk outside. I tell Niski, okay, Niski, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you carry the pizzas. Who's going to carry the pizzas and the logs? So we walk outside. We have to like walk quite a distance because the K-Cop office is like uh, in a secluded area and it's like a gated area. We walk outside. Uh, we, we go to pick up the pizzas and basically not a, one, a single driver can't deliver all the pizzas. So I convince Niski and, uh, and, and everybody else, Clement, Cabo and, 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 and the performance coach of, of, of KCOR for us to basically stay, stand outside with the pizzas that have arrived and wait for the other pizzas. And that's perfect for me, right? So I order my Uber and I stand outside with the homies eating Quattro formaggio pizza. And I'm slamming pizzas on end, pizzas on end, pizzas on end. I eat a solid one and a half out of these 20. No joke. And then it's time for me to make my exit. They are confused. They thought I'm going to carry the pizza. No, I was there to eat the pizza. And it was the perfect time to make my exit because my train was leaving in three hours. <laughs> My train was leaving <laughs> in three hours. <laughs> to summarize, I think the energy of KCX and the fans is unmatched. I think the only thing that I can compare it to is the energy with some of the biggest sports teams ever. Really, that's the only comparable energy. And I think what's so insane about KCOP is that, you know, the people that are attending these events, everyone comes with a very clear intention. Everyone's there to fucking have a good time. Everyone's there to have a good time. And it's like when I look upon the crowd of people, you know, you have really, really, like you have, you have all of the, like all kinds of people, all kinds of people. It is like nerds or whatever. It's like all kinds of people. Everybody is represented. And that is insane. That is insane, by the way. K-Cop has really, really, really nailed it. Really nailed it. And in terms of their announcements, the arena for 3,000 people. Oh, yeah, yeah, brilliant. People are going to ask, why do LSC teams don't do this? Because they don't have the same foundation. They don't have the same foundation. They don't have the same foundation and the same core fan base that is as strong as the French community. And it's not something that you can necessarily replicate. This is the accumulation of so much effort and time and consistency that is impossible to replicate. And 
And then the final announcement, you know, that K-Cup is closer than ever to secure the spot to the LEC. I'm going to tell you guys the truth. K-Cup doesn't need the LEC. The LEC needs K-Cup. G2, Fnatic, they are dreaming and hoping that K-Cup joins the LEC. Everybody. Everybody. That loves the LEC is hoping that K-Cop makes it through. And whether it's this year or next year, doesn't matter because it will eventually happen. It will eventually happen. There's no avoiding it. It will eventually happen. If not this year, then next year. And there's no rush. And in terms of organization, security, bro, security was amazing. Organization was amazing. Sure, in terms of scheduling, that could have been better because I heard, maybe I shouldn't talk about this, but going overtime in a stadium before like public transport closes down is generally uh, a, a very bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> if it, it theoretically happens if it theoretically happens it is not a good thing they talked about it they said it themselves yes there's gonna be a fucking big ass fine and Carnage was having such a good time he was put the, he was playing with the flames I feel like he had like 50% fuel left for the League of Legends match and he just started blasting all of <laughs> all, all of the fuel at the same time almost borderline cooking <laughs> cooking the players on stage apparently it was a cold flame it, it was a cold flame so there was no fire possible but still it looked kind of funny when the players were like throwing water my man was was really really cooking and then on top of that t1 versus k cop in december i hope i hope that the rosters remain the same because we don't know what's going to happen with the t1 roster and we also don't know what k cop uh, the k cop roster is going to look like but i don't know what's going on within k corp but i think that any player that is on k corp should look to stay in k corp until they get into the lec Unless you somehow can join a guaranteed top three team in the LEC. Career-wise, I think um, it's your best uh, decision. To summarize, guys, KCX, I spent a lot of fucking money on travel that I didn't take, but I would, uh, I would redo it every time. And it was amazing to live that in person, and uh, I recommend that to... Everyone. I would recommend it to anyone. And a special shout out for, to, to Kute and to uh, Clement for really, really hooking me up and making it as easy as possible for me in terms of tickets, in terms of everything. Uh, a shout out to, to Kamito too for being so humble and polite, you know, regardless of everything that is going on. Very, very genuine person. Shout out to the Keiko players too. Special shout out to Kabo as well. Uh, we share a lot of history. I care about him deeply, you know. It was good to see his family as well. You know, his brother, brother the biker. And um, you see Sak and Kalist and all other players and staff of the game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, I went to the K-Cop office. Uh, I went to the K-Cop office and uh, we, we hung out there. Now, KCX was a massive success and it was... Uh, uh, Really, really nice. Do you understand now? No, I always understood. There's no need to, for you to, to, to speak so rudely to me. Um, I was uh, having conversations with Cabo already back then. And uh, I also said the same publicly, right? Do you review the game low? Uh, no, it's not necessary. I already live viewed it, so it's okay. I got to co-stream this one. It's not like the OTP that I can't co-stream.
All right. Uh, now to proceed. Uh, basically, like I, I get a lot of questions uh, about what my future is. Uh, I, I get spammed all the time. KC Amato, KC Amato, uh, which is which is funny to me. You know, I I, I hope uh, <laughs> I, I hope uh, no one feels anything bad. You know, uh, about it in regards to it. You know, full respect to to the coaches and so forth that have managed to accomplish what they have accomplished. You know, I think in the context of um, K Corp uh, joining the LEC, you know, uh, that would be like a big dream of mine uh, to to work with K Corp. Um, it would be a big dream of mine, um, but uh, the way everything uh, plays out, you know, you never know how things play out. I think uh, K-Corp is doing everything right, and uh, I think anyone uh, would be uh, proud to represent the colors, you know, I think anyone would be proud to do so. On my end, right, in terms of what I'm looking for uh, in the future, it's like the reason I stream, the reason I keep so active in the league community is to keep my mind fresh and to make sure that I'm always in tune, right? Always, always in tune and to prepare myself for the next coaching opportunity that makes the most sense to me, right? Of course, I love to do it too. I love League of Legends. I'm absolutely in love with League of Legends. I love this game. I love the competition. I love the sport. I bleed for it. I live for it. I have worked with it for 13 years. I will uh, not move on until the game dies completely. Or it chews me and spits me out. Even then, I will work my way back in. But I'm now in a position where I can choose very, very carefully my opportunities. When I join a team, I want to make sure that uh, everything aligns in my interest. And I know that we can build something where we can beat G2 and break them apart. Because I'm imagining that G2 is not going to make any changes, right? So G2 is the team to beat. <laughs> and I want to be the one to do it but I require very specific people by my side so I am very very selective in what offer that I would accept and what offer that I am willing to entertain and that is the privilege that I have um, built for myself through my work in my content creation, and so forth. That is the privilege that I've built for myself. So for when people ask me, yo, are you going to coach next year? If the right opportunity arrives. Because I'm getting offers left and right. But the offer needs to really, really support the vision. And I need to be able to have people with me that support the vision too. Because I will not settle for anything less than to win the LEC and to have a vision that follows the same thing. And there's very, very specific, specific people that I have in mind, you know, in terms of who uh, I want to work with. And they know it too. And hopefully uh, we can find the right place to build our fortress that is going to dominate the LEC for many years to come. I am privileged in the fact and why I've worked very, very hard to make sure that I don't need to sign with the team just to sign with the team, just to stay afloat. That is what I've built up for myself. So when the th time comes and I can build exactly what I want to build together with my brothers, then you see me coach again. If that is next year, I'm having some very, very positive conversations already. Very, very positive conversations. So we shall see, my friends. Very positive conversations.
But that's all I can reveal for now. On the flip side, if the time is not right, then I just commit to what I'm doing. You see me co stream every single league, every single match. You see me working on the LEC if they have me in any capacity. And you see me as busy as ever. I believe this year, right? In theory, I have taken a year off of competition. But at the same time, I have streamed pretty much 300 hours every month. I've kept very busy. I've worked very, very hard to stay active. But I have to say, taking time off competition, the main thing that it has taught me and what I've become aware of more is how I want to structure. Like, I've always talked about how and, and thought about how I want to structure things. But now viewing everything from outside and really, really digesting my past and what I've been through has made it very, very clear to me of what I believe is important and what I believe I want to achieve from, from day one. Because in a lot of cases, I, 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 I coach very instinctually. You know, I read people, I, I, I manage people. This is my biggest strength. I read rooms, I read environments, and I find ways to communicate and to, to really, really interact in the best possible way, calculated way with individuals to get the most out of them. Very instinctual, right? But in terms of the preparation, now I feel like I've finally gotten the time to really, really prepare everything in a way that is going to build a championship winning team. And I know which people that I want next to me in order to achieve that. Because they would cover for my weaknesses. And together with their strengths, we would dominate. And I don't want to mention names. The reason I don't want to mention names is because some of them are still on the contract. There's so still some people that are busy and competing, so it's not the time and place to do so. So this is players and staff. And the time will come eventually where I will be a sports director slash GM uh, for a team. And I think the time will come when I feel like there are people that can take my role in a team environment too. You know? It will be something that eventually I will progress into. I'm sure. So to summarize, if I find a team, a dream team, and I build a dream team coming into next year, then you'll see me coaching. If that can't happen, I'm not going to accept an offer just to compete. I am going to accept an offer that fulfills the values and the philosophy that I care about and have people that align on that interest. Otherwise, you'll see me co-streaming every league, you'll see me uh, working with the LEC, you'll see me making content, and you'll see me on the screen as per usual. Wiki says, what about the things you have no control over? Sickness, economics, personal performance, team dynamics? Team dynamics, you have control over. Personal performances, you have control over. Sickness, you have to some degree control over, but of course there are things that you don't have control over. Economics are going to be apparent to me before it happens, right? If I'm going to make a super roster and uh, someone loses uh, their arm because they put their arm into a like a pool of sharks, then sure, I can't make the roster, but you know that's the whole point, right? If we can make... If we can make, if the roster and the, the situation and the circumstance can occur where I will be satisfied, then, then I'll proceed. And if not, I will be the sleeping dragon under the mountain that will breathe and rest carefully for the time for me to spread my wings.
So I touched briefly on the effect of um, a break. And it's been very beneficial to me. Because keep in mind, right? I have, I have been on. On for 13 years. For 13 years, I've been on. Season 1, tournament after tournament. Every go for all, I played it. Every IM qualifier, I played it. 4PL, like IPL. Everything, I played it. Season 1. Season 2, I followed the same way. Season 3, I was playing, I was in school, high school, and I was playing the LEC at the same time. So basically, or EU LCS at the same time. So basically, I went to school five days a week, and then from school, I flew to Cologne, and then I, I and it took me 10 hours, and then I played the L L LCS. Then next morning, I flew, then I went to school, and it was on, on, on. On. I was on. Season 4... I was competing, making rosters, but I couldn't find the roster that made sense. What did I do? I was casting in Swedish. I was casting LCS and both European and North American and the World Championship. And I was held up in this random fuck place in Sweden, but it paid me 80 euro per day and I was so grateful. I was in the middle of nowhere playing only Hearthstone on my iPad because that was the only form of entertainment that I could bring along with me because I couldn't afford a laptop. And that was how I kept going. And we did Analyst Desk, we did the commentary. So I basically, I did, I did six games straight every single day, four days a week. Uh, and then Super Weeks, it was seven days a week. I was talking in front of a camera 10 hours straight. 10 hours straight. And that was... Fantastic. And then eventually we did the World Finals, Samsung White winning. We did it on Swedish national television, right? And then season five came along. I started my coaching journey and then you know the story of my coaching journey, right? I've been on, 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 on. Never ever have I slowed down. The years where I didn't qualify to the World Championship, I reviewed every single World Championship game on this YouTube channel, right? So I've been on. So this year, I was still on, let's be honest. I was streaming way too much. I was super, super busy co-streaming all of it because I want to build something real. But taking that step away from competition has been very, very refreshing. Very refreshing. And now I feel in tune with myself. It's like I've taken time to really, really get my health in order. My sleeping is fucking phenomenal. Besides when I go to KCX. My sleeping is super good. My gym is super super good it's like i i have i've made excuses for myself as to why i don't have the time to do it uh when i'm in competition right but now i have the routine down i am also so aware of the things and the building blocks and the steps that i want to go through to make sure to never ever commit the mistakes that i did in previous years right and everyone commits mistakes, and I will commit mistakes in the future too, but now I feel more ready than ever. More ready than ever, man. More ready than ever, I tell you. And that brings me to uh, the next conversation. Uh, during the World Championship, uh, basically... We have more Voice of Your Models coming out uh, that are going to be very related to the World Championship. Uh, I can give you guys some teasers. It's like the guests that I have lined up, guys, I don't even know if I should reveal them because I don't want to jinx it not happening. But we have potential people from the LPL. We have potential people from North America. We have potential people from Europe that are actively competing. And it's going to bang. It's going to absolutely bang. I am so excited for it. No, people in competition. People in competition. People in competition. And we're going to stay busy with the voice of your models. And I can tell you as well that I've had very, very positive conversations in, in regards to some of the teams. In regards for my co-streaming for the World Championship. So I'm hoping that I land the co-streaming for the World Championship. The breakdowns after each single day will happen always. 
So don't worry about that. I will always summarize each each day. Each day I will summarize, we will have the summaries, we will have the discussions with my thoughts. Right? Hopefully we get co-streaming so I can hang out with the nutsack. Otherwise, I will of course do the reviews after the fact. If I don't get co-streaming, there's no point for me to watch that live, sadly. And I am going to uh, just do the reviews after the show. Because keep in mind, you know, if I'm co-streaming without having co-streaming, it's like I am competing, you know, I'm, comp I'm in a boxing match blindfolded against the other co-streamers. Let's be honest. So it's better for me to carve out a different niche in the case where I don't get co-streaming, right? You guys understand the logic of this, right? The logic of this. And basically, if everything starts at 5 a.m., it's basically 5 a.m., I'm not going to co-view all the matches and then review the matches too. It would basically be our own stream where we are going to review every single match of the World Championship and we're going to create a niche type of thing uh, against and, and, and of course against the co-streamers. Additionally, we'll be tracking the pros. We'll be tracking the pros all of the way. I am just waiting for them to show up. I'm waiting for them to show up. When the pro starts playing in Korea, we're going to be tracking the pros and it's going to be fantastic. We're going to watch every single solo game. We're going to watch Cho. We're going to learn about the meta. We're going to build a clear image of player strength. We're going to look for those specific matchups. You are going to see every single important solo queue match right on this stream. And this is what's to come for the World Championship. There is a slight chance that I'm going to fly out to Korea. I will probably go for the World Finals. Uh, but that is like TBD. TBD. But I won't be on the official broadcast. The final thing I wanted to cover before we go to the Q&A section of um, this stream. I wanted to talk about a um, very important topic. You know, in regards to Keiko, right? It's like it was recently leaked. And I don't know if it's true because it's a leak, right? That the LEC is moving towards making an 18-year-old restriction on the league. So the truth is, right, the LEC has consistently, right, over the last couple of years, made decisions for the health of the esports teams that have an LEC slot and the business side of it. Let's bring it back to the format. So the format in itself, right? It's, I don't need, know the exact effect the format has had on metrics, okay? But in terms of what it does for competition, as a competitor, I don't like it at all because three BO, three BO1s on the same week compacted into one and then it's like you only get so few best of threes. Clearly the format in the LPL and Korea is clearly superior with the best of threes. Clearly superior for competitive integrity. Right? Stay with me, okay? This is gonna, I'm going to paint a picture here, right? Best of threes, clearly better. Having a 17 or a 16 year old restriction on the league is also clearly better for competition, right? Having the league end earlier so teams can prepare for the world championship in the best way possible is also clearly better. But now the scheduling has been set up in a very, very certain, very, very specific way, right? The focus is money generation. The focus is the health of the league, which of course is tied to money generation. 
my point is, right, is while I really, really don't like it because true and true, I am co a competitor, I cannot fault the logic of it. The, the other example that I would do, like, let's say I'm suffering from a heart attack and I'm going to die, right? I might not like that I'm dying, but I'm fine with the logic of it because it's occurring. Maybe that's a terrible example. Because this is essentially being done for the health of the LEC teams. Because inherently, there will be no competition if there is no money and no revenue to support the teams in the LEC. So that needs to be the number one priority. The same thing for the operation costs of the LEC broadcast. The health of these things need to be prioritized. Because if in the long run, everything is operating at a negative, the competition will bleed out and die. So sacrificing the competitive side of it in order to, of course, maintain a balance of revenue, things are going to be good. Because as mentioned before, right? A best of three system is clearly better for competition. Viewership might suffer. And also additionally, the costs of running the broadcast on the day on a day-to-day -day basis is insanely expensive. I, I drew up some ballpark numbers in my mind, and I might be like wrong on this, but I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if it costs like 400 k to 500 k to run an LEC day. I wouldn't be surprised if it's insanely expensive. Because you might see the screens, but the amount of cameramen, the amount of security, the producers, the broadcast, the work that is done ahead of time, the hours, the staff, everything that is involved in making a show happen, whether it's travel, managers, player managers, talent, security, you need to have medical staff, you need to have foyer on site, you need to have food, and you need to have catering you need to have so many elements down for a show day that it becomes insanely expensive and that is you know the two main arguments against the best of three system that it will bleed out viewership and at the same time it would be insanely expensive to run of course the studio and have the whole enterprise running for each and single every single day that is the biggest challenge so that's why I understand, right? I am I am aware and I accept the logic of it, even though on a competitive standpoint, I don't like it. Because it's insanely expensive to run a single day in the LEC studio. Very expensive. And the LEC is a very, very unique product, right? The casters and what they build up together with the producers, it is... They can make the show so special and unique every time just because it's centered around two specific days. And then additionally, right, the rule of the 18, like the cap being raised to 18 years on a competitive side, that's going to be terrible. How many 17-year-olds, 16-year-olds have come in and dominated? Because they get their shot, right? Kalist would have been one of those players. Pays is one of those players. There's a bunch of players that opened up their career at 17. Bin is one of those players. There's so many players that open up their career at a very, very young age. And dominated. So obviously... From a competitive side, this is going to sting. This is going to sting really fucking hard. There's so many goddamn players that have broken out on the scene at the age of 17 and have popped off. And limiting yourself from that pool from a competitive side is a disadvantage. But, once again... I might not like it, but I understand the logic of it. This is where the most amount of money is available. 
Alcohol sponsorships. Gambling sponsorships. Crypto sponsorships. Give the most revenue. And I don't know which one is coming in or if this is what's what's coming in. Riot doesn't allow gambling. Well, things might change, right? We don't know how this is going to play out. The thing is, you know, the, the dark side of it, right, is that um, these type of sponsorships, the reason they pay out so well is because they make a lot of money off of their ads too. That is the dark side of it. But I think in the end, right, I think that everyone should be allowed to indulge in anything that they want to. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the way money circulates around the world, I'm not going to fault anyone for how they make their money. Unless they're like actively like scamming people, of course. You know, if you show up on a CoffeeZilla video, you know, probably, you know, it's, uh, it's a rough one. But you get me, right? Once again, I might not like it, but I accept and I agree with the logic of it. And the reason I'm bringing all of these things up is because the disadvantages of the LEC competing at a global level are going to just become greater and greater. And let me tell you guys a harsh truth. The gap was never closed ever since it began expanding back in season three. Even in the years of 2019 and 2018, where Fnatic made the world finals and 2019, where G2 made finals and they also won MSI, the gap was still really, really big. And I say this because Fnatic at the time was a heavy outlier. And at the same time, G2 was also a heavy, heavy, heavy outlier. Why? Why were they an outlier? Because there were factors in terms of how the team was built. They managed to put together five players that were the best in their position. The best in their position. Okay? Five players that were the best in their position and they peaked all at the same time. All right. Already that in itself is insanely hard to do because putting five players together and all of them performing super, super well, even Mickey had the hand injury at one point. That could have gone wrong. Promise Q subbed in, but then Mickey came in and won MSI. Right. Things can go wrong. Things can go insanely wrong, both in creating the roster and also in terms of maintaining the roster. Additionally, right? Think of other elements that occur and play out in a year. The meta. The meta aligned perfectly for G2. And additionally, they were outliers because they figured out a way to play the game ahead of everybody else. They were very fluid and loose in the way they played. It wasn't tied necessarily. They didn't pick to play away. They picked and then played away. Do you guys understand? They were very flexible in the way they played because they picked the strongest champs that they perceived were the strongest and then figured out the way they played. Rather than the other way around, for example, as T1, they picked the champions to play a certain way because they wanted to play that set way all the time. And G2 were clever enough to play very, very strong on side and they were very good at figuring out how to win from each position. And the buy-in from each player was there. So they were outliers in terms of play. They were an outlier in terms of how the roster was set up. And additionally, if we think about factors that was outside of G2, even looking at MSI, something as simple as MSI. As simple as MSI. What the fuck happened to IG? I don't want to take anything away from G2 because G2 smacked Team Liquid on the forehead and had a fantastic series against T1. But... IG completely collapsed, completely collapsed. And that's another factor, right? Luck is where opportunity and preparation meets, right? 
everything has to be everything plays out in a very certain way for you and you need to make sure that when this shit happens you're ready to beat the shit out of team liquid the same way team liquid were ready to beat down ig when they dropped the ball their preparation met where the opportunity was given to them by ig right additionally right 2019 2018 were very very big rebuild years for korea because keep in mind who came into the league? You think of three teams came in from challengers. You had Damwon, you had Griffin, and of course you had Sandbox. If you think about the players that were on these rosters and what kind of impact they've had on Korea and also on a global scale, thinking Viper, for example, in the LPL winning the World Championship, these were very, very important players. And there was a restructuring happening in Korea as the Fnatic and the G2 dominance was occurring. Right? And my point is, these circumstances were a very, very crucial you know, all of these circumstances were crucial in g 2 success. And my point is, if the LEC ever wants to be competitive, they need to have an extreme outlier. And the thing is, each team that wins the World Championship, they are going to be outliers in some shape or form. They're going to have the right meta hit at the right time. They're going to peak at the right time. There's not going to be any health complication. Winning the World Championship requires an element of luck in the way I describe luck, where preparation and opportunity meets. The opportunity needs to be there, right? And when you think of, right, for example, last year at Worlds, the Chinese teams didn't talk about it too much, but all of the Chinese teams had heavy COVID, and they all got sick. And that shit fucking hurts you, right? It hurts you, and it impacts your chances, because shit like that can happen. Shit like that can happen. And how you navigate that, and how you move along with that, is super, super crucial, right? Your resilience, your durability, and your player skill matter super, super much. Of course, there's a lot of tangible things that you need to do in order to perform and need to be ready, right? The preparation for that opportunity, right? It's crucial. But it all starts in the team building, and it all starts in the methodology. And in order for... It's like the odds of that outlier that is going to win the world championship, that outlier has a way higher chance of coming out of Korea and coming out of China due to better investment, better structure, better culture, better players, better solo queue. Why are there better players? It's because they have a history of winning and those players beget winning too. The, the, play, the structure that is in place for players to succeed is way stronger, way more solid, and they practice harder, and they work harder, and the standard is way harder too, and way, way better too. So many players that come as imports to Europe, they come, they come in here and they're at a shock because they don't have the same level of resistance and that force that forces them to work super, super hard because the environment is inherently very, very different because the standard has been set. When you play against better teams, better players, the challenge is so direct in your face that you na naturally become better if it's meant to be. To end this on a positive note, there is many circumstances in history and also in different sports where all of the odds are stacked against a certain team but they become outliers due to their methods. They become outliers due to their practice and they become outliers due to extraordinary individuals working together. I've made the example multiple times, but for example, the Dagestani wrestlers, okay? They have figured out a way to work. They figured out the culture. They figured out the way to work and they don't have you know, endless resources like some of the other governments that are trying to, you know, create the strongest wrestlers. They might not have, you know, the same, you know, uh, you know, odds, right? But they figured out a way to become the best. And that makes them an outlier.
So if an LSC team is going to be competitive at the World Championship and make for that bid, they need to make a... They need to be so unique in their approach that it puts them ahead of the forces globally. Because the solution will never be to mimic and try to trying to catch up in the methodology that the Korean teams and the Chinese teams have mastered. The LEC needs to find the leg kick. The LEC needs to find leg kicks and evolve the whole meta. <laughs> They need to, we need to find the leg kick, whether it's in the practice method or in the gameplay method. All of these things matter. But not to be doom and gloom again. The odds of the Chinese teams and the Korean teams of finding the next evolution of gameplay is also way, way higher. Way, way higher. So the odds are completely stacked against us. And if there ever, if we ever live to see an LEC team lift the World Championship trophy, I will sit there and tell you why they are such a extreme outlier. Whether that is through innovation in draft, through innovation in gameplay, or innovation in practice method, or innovation in terms of figuring out who is the next best player, all of these things can be. I just wanted to go on this rant to say, you know, the LEC needs to focus on its survival and its health first. So I underline it with what I've said multiple times already in this conversation. I agree with the logic of it, even though I don't like it. That's why these changes like raising the rules to 18 is important. That's why Wunder was allowed to sub in, right? Even though uh, Fnatic have a sub top laner in academy right because making the product good and digestible and also sellable to sponsors is the priority because like these teams the, the orgs need to survive it's not some charity project right No cast in France, though, if there are such partnerships, uh, they will just create clean feeds just like they did with uh, the Buzz Light uh, and ALCS if that's how things are going to move. I don't want us. Now, don't say that I want this. I, I want a DLC to be as competitive as possible. But I also understand that it's like, there are a lot of jobs on the line. And it's like, if, if, if you guys think that being competitive is the only measurement that things get, you know, measured by, then why is the LPL the region with the lowest English viewership? Performance isn't the most important thing. Personalities, drama, storylines, this is what people care for. I assure you, this these are the things that are interesting to people. Why on earth then, you know, is the LFL with K Corp having so much viewership? Because people buy into the story and care. It's not only about competing at the world scale.
Don't get me wrong. If I'm working in the LEC, I will work with the intention of winning the World Championship. I will work with the biggest intention. I have always worked with the intention of winning the World Championship. Because how on earth can you call yourself a competitor if this is not your intention? So this will always be my intention. Against all odds, it will always be my intention. And I will tell the players the same. And I will tell the players the same. Eventually you're going to play your last game of the fucking season. And this is what you're giving me in scrims? This game is an opportunity for you to prepare for what eventually will be your last game of the season. And we're going to work so fucking hard to make sure that that last game of the season is the fucking World Finals. And whether it doesn't happen or does happen, doesn't matter. Because the intensity behind how you work is crucial. Someone asked why LEC team's not in Korea yet. Money. Money. Boot camping in Korea costs money. And that's why teams are flying out late. Teams are flying out late because boot camping in Korea is fucking expensive. That is one of the reasons. And it ties to the previous conversation. You know, looking at the factors that might, that are beneficial for G2, right? G2 is the hope of Western League of Legends. Understandable. I think they're a great team. I think they can do some damage. Will they be able to beat uh, top two teams of out of LCK and out of uh, LPL? Maybe, maybe on a good day, they can pray to beat a T1. But no way, right? They're going to be the underdog against every fucking team. They're going to be the underdog. And even beating Weibo and Damwon is going to be a fucking hard task. A very hard task. Very, very hard task. The reason I say T1 on a bad day is because they've shown some really fucking horrible days. And maybe if they are lucky enough, right? In a BO1, right? KT somehow just run it down when they play against T1. Even Down One and Weibo are incredibly hard teams to beat. My, what I wanted to bring up that gives G2 better chances is the fact that Asian Games is right there. Asian Games being right there, right, is uh, a big plus. Because some teams are not going to be able to practice. JGG is not going to practice. They're going to practice less. You have T1 practicing less. Chovy practicing less. They are practicing on 13-12. They're playing Asian games. And also... And also... G2 has time to fly out to Korea and actually boot camp. Last year at Worlds, no team from Europe practiced uh, with uh, international teams. They came out to New York six days before competition. Asian Games team ranking, very easy. Korea, China, Chinese Taipei. That's it. Not that complicated. Okay. If LEC teams not even are going to invest to be at their best at Worlds, well, yeah, then it's over. Well, the thing is, it's like, where do you think money comes from? Where do you think money comes from? Do you think they just like invest? Just invest. I have this investment tree that I can just pick the leaves from, and then I'm going to invest. I'm going to take loans and risk all, all of these jobs. I'm going to risk them. To invest. And yeah, you know, there's many teams that fucked up big time with their investments. Let's be honest. There's many teams out there that fucked up big time with their investments. Like they signed a player for 3 million 
and they think uh, we're going to win championships fast and it's going to bring us uh, the championships of the future. Many teams have done that. Let's be honest. They rush to pay the biggest fucking salaries to try to take shortcuts to winning championships and they believe that it's going to pay off in the long run. And that is really, really bad. The fact is, guys, the health of esports in terms of the money is very poor. And keep in mind, esports is a product that at, at first needs to stay alive. And we've covered everything extensively. Keep in mind, guys, I might, I, I, I want to underline this, that I am, this is, all speculation. I don't even know if the raising to 18 is true because it's like a fucking Pokemon said it on Twitter, right? How in the world did they come to conclusion that any player is worth so much? So basically the logic was, right? The logic of these teams was that eventually the franchise spot is going to be very, very expensive. So a lot of VC money came in. A lot of investment money, this investment that Homie was talking about before. People were throwing money. And the idea was, oh, if we spend a lot of money now and win championships now, we're going to snowball that into the next championship. Because the way it works... It's like you win, you attract the right players, you attract the right eyeballs, and you create a certain element of a snowball, right? Win the championships today for a very, very big money and win them cheaper later down the line. That is the idea, right? The winner takes it all. And this logic was obviously giga flawed because there are teams out there that won championships that people still don't, gi still don't give a fuck about. And that is where, you know, the whole influencer topic comes in, where these influencer-driven teams is where the most passionate storylines are coming in. Right? That is where we're moving, right? Uh, new Gertzi, you're not really following uh, because you call uh, your 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 conversation, right? Your 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 point doesn't make any sense with what has been said. I'm just explaining why teams spent an absurd amount of money on big players that didn't lead to anything. It's the same. What's happening? You know, this, this, this happens other way, uh, other way, uh, other way, uh, other places too. So they're signing Messi, they're signing Ronaldo, you know? It's like, when these guys retire, do you think anyone's going to give a shit? Yeah, for sure. It's like JDG, like in, in China, I don't know what kind of revenue streams they have or how many jerseys they can sell or how they are generating revenue, you know, but the rumored cost 16 million for the JDG roster. I'm not sure. China is on a whole different level. Honestly, China is on a whole different level in terms of their fan activation, in terms of how they generate money. That's a whole nother level there, man. It's like the amount of eyeballs they have there and the amount of money that the Chinese fans are willing to spend it's not the same conversation as Europe. It's not the same conversation. Europe is a very different landscape. Skeggy, what are you talking about? So basically, I'm going to make sure that I don't get one guide. A lot of the things that you guys are writing have already been covered in what I talked about. I think it's time for me to uh, move to the Q&A section of uh, uh, the, the podcast. 
Shakaraz asks, I'll just, uh, I guess I'll just pull it up. Shakaraz asks, what was the thing I begged that you liked the most? Honestly, there was this like lemon square type thing that was insanely delicious. There was also like this apple cake that you made that really, really was mind blowing. I think between the apple cake and the lemon square, those things were really, really mind blowing. Like that, that shit was wow. That was something else. Really, really. Shakaraz is um, like the best baker ever, man. Just the best baker. Wow. Uh, Captain Flowers asks, what is your favorite shirt suit of all the shirts and suits you own? So basically my favorite suit is this um, this blue uh, double-chested with stripes uh, suit. Uh, it's a Italian cut, tailor-made from Berlin. Really, really gorgeous. Really good fabric. Fantastic. Boom. And the favorite shirt that I own is actually this one. This this shirt, if you really, really zoom in, like, do you see the little animals, guys? Fuck, man, zooming in doesn't fucking help at all. You guys see these little animals? Bro, there's like, I think there's like families of Indian people, there's like frogs, and you're inside of these are like notes as well. I really like this show, man. I mean, I really like this shirt. I don't really like the shirt, bro. I miss my beard, bro. What did I do? What did I do, bro? It's a good shirt. Thank you for your question, Captain Flowers and Shakaras. Shimmer asks, would you coach a LCS team? So in the past, yes. So basically, in the last off season, I was talking to C9, but they decided to go in a different direction. I was intrigued by that. Uh, in the past, I signed a contract with Team Liquid. You guys remember when they didn't make playoffs and then they got tactical instead of double lift, right? Uh, but at this point in time, I have no interest of going to the LCS. These were very, very unique opportunities that were intriguing. Uh, I have no interest of working in the LCS. I'm not going to lie. Zero interest. It has to be like the craziest roster ever. And... I would have to, if I move to the LCS, it is because I'm getting paid way too much money. And I think that ship has sailed. Uh, Kalis fan account, will you play Kalis as Casey's ADC for the LCT team as he won't be able to play with the 18 restriction? Well, obviously, if the LEC is restricting him from playing, they need an AD carry. They're not going to play 4v5 to prove a point. Stupid question. Quintero, what was the game one versus Schalke about in summer 2019 playoffs? That's with Carlton and Grace Double Jungle. How was it supposed to work and why wasn't it revisited in the future while it didn't really lose the game? Uh, because only level one fight did. So basically, I, I pulled up this game uh, ahead of time. Uh, I'm I'm giving it a like to 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 highlight the fact that uh, I um, I um, I have answered it. So basically, <laughs> never never heard before. This is going to be an exclusive, guys. For those only listening to this through voice, this is going to be very very hard to explain unless you see the visual. So basically, the strategy of this is. We move our Jace down from top. We're going to invade. And basically, basically the idea here is Kartus at the time. So basically you didn't need a jungle item, if I remember correctly. Maybe I'm wrong there. Uh, basically the idea is that we're going to do red and raptors at the same time. But before we do the camps, we're going to make this midwave 1 HP. We're going to make it 1 HP, okay? We're going to make it 1 HP with Kartus spells, with Zaya spells, with everyone, and Jace is going to stand here, okay? Jace is going to stand here. And then the wave is chunked, Jace comes, and he's going to take the full wave. He takes the full wave, he takes 6 CS instantly, because the wave, all of it is 1 HP, okay? So he has 6 CSs already. And now Kartus is doing the Raptors, Jace takes two small Raptors. Kartu still reaches level 2, and Jace gets level 2, and Graves takes red. Just because we have taken the wave here, 
this wave crashes in the mid wave, we are going to cross through the mid and invade the enemy topside with Kartus and Graves together. And Jace, after taking the mid wave, will TP top or will react depending on what's happening top. And through this strategy, enemy jungle is completely dead. Done. Jace is it's turbo far ahead. And Kartus and Graves are giga far ahead. And basically the whole strategy is Kartus and Graves, they keep pushing mid-wave and keep taking every fucking jungle camp on the map. Making Sejuani bleed out of her balls. But in this particular game, if they contest camps, it's FF no. The thing is, we pull our top laner down. So we are 5v4 in this space. And the strategy relies on us having a very strong level 1. But in this particular game, if I remember correctly, they actually... Uh, for some reason, we don't go Ezreal Braum. Like, Ezreal Braum was the strategy. This strategy relies on you being way stronger level 1. But Caitlyn and fucking Morgana fucked us. So it was just grief. So basically, you need to be stronger 5v5. You need to be stronger 5v5. You need to hard win 5v5. Because keep in mind, these are the champions we're picking. We have Jace, Graves, Kartus. And then we wanted to play like Ezreal Braum. That was like a combination of champions that we played. But the issue here is like, they were aware. I don't know if they had a leak or something. Because we did this in scrims and we did this successfully. And they... They uh, basically fucked us and we lost a lot of HP. The Q's hit right and we're losing HP and we can lose this HP. It's crucial. And now they're just fighting us to the death. And they reacted well. But that's the explanation of it. The thing is, people say that it's a flip, but it's not really a flip. Because it all comes down to you being stronger level 1. But the issue here, Caitlyn Morgana is just fucking us. And that's it. Their champions are piss useless, everyone. We just played it really bad, and Kate Morgana carried this. If you're stronger 5v5 here in this area, and you can push the enemy out and pull the wave mid, there is, not, there is no flip. Would something like this work today? Uh, not necessarily, right? They see us on this ward, that's why Nara's moving, you know. Why did you do it then? It's like we we thought we would win level one. And probably if we play better we would win. It's like Mowgli over postures, he's hitting, loses HP, and then now the game is over, right? It's like we just fuck up the execution big time. It's like yeah, the game is just lost. But yeah, uh, this this uh, this person asked, right? He asked, so I'm just answering. Uh, what do you think about the new world's format? Can it bring more competitiveness between minor and major regions? Will this disparity hardly be overcome regardless of format? Uh, so basically, I think that um, it is going to be harder to qualify through your own skill because you have to win a best of three to qualify. But you can be far more lucky to actually uh, qualify. So basically, if you're a minor region team, and the major region is only Korea and LPL, let's be honest. If you're a minor region team, European or any, anything of, uh, of anything else. Uh, if you're a European and North American, you are basically, the way you want to qualify is by winning the first two BO1s. If you lose a BO1, you're in big trouble. Why do I say that? Because if you go 2-0 in the BO1s, you actually have three best of three chances to qualify to the event. And that's three potential rounds where you face an easy opponent. You have to win the BO1s. Let's say you go 1-1 one, one, and then you go 2-1 and then your best of 3 start. You only have two best of 3s. 
Because the way the format works is, if you have three match wins, you qualify. If you have three match loses, you are out. If you reach two loses, losses, or two wins through BO1s, that's where best of three starts. Every qualifying series and disqualifying series is a best of three. So basically, what do I think about the new world format? It's like the edge that the LEC and the LCS can potentially find is if they're lucky, they get 2-0 in the BO1s, and then they have three best of three chances to qualify by, by playing against some shitters. But this also means that there's going to be teams that are really good that won't qualify because they'll be unlucky. So this is, you know, every day there will be a new, new, like, uh, there will be like a new lottery for what the matchups will be because the first set of matchups have rules. Basically, number one, uh, seed one pools face seed four pools, seed two pools uh, face seed three pools. They can't play each other and they can't play their own region. But then afterwards, these things don't matter anymore. These things are just out of uh, the question, right? Then it's all about scoreline. 1-0 versus 1-0, 0-1 versus 0-1. My fear is if a big team like JDG loses first two games on purpose just to clean up worse teams from the lower side of the bracket. I don't know why they would want to do that, but yeah, <laughs> could happen, I guess. It's just, <laughs> I don't know why they would do that. Why, like, according to them, according to JDG, everyone's a weaker team. But I think this is going to be beneficial for uh, LPL teams, you know? Qualifying, disqualifying series, best of three, good. But a lot of luck is going to be involved here. I'm going to tell you this. LEC teams or minor region teams most likely are not going to qualify on their merit. They will qualify based off of luck. And the best thing that you can do for the LEC is win two BO1s. If you win two BO1s and you're 2-0, your odds of qualifying become super, super high. And BO1s is the easiest opportunity that you can be offered to actually upset someone. All right? All right, that's answered. How else feel to be the new secret coach for KC LEC in 2024? Okay. Yamaro, what good and solid advice would you give a player who feels stuck in low elo? And a question about you. After watching the interview, we wonder how do you think your approach to coaching pro players has evolved over the years? Uh, these are very, very large questions. Well, uh, good and solid advice is the usual. Stick to one role, stick to one champion. Uh, the, the more you play the same champion, the easier it becomes to actually develop ideas in terms of how you win. Uh, the less you need to... Think about how you play your matchups and how you play your champion, the more you can think about other aspects of the game, and then you can prove aspects that are going to carry over between the games in terms of how to win. Uh, another crucial detail in terms of winning more is that always ping what you want to do ahead of time. Don't ping it as it happens. This is such a crucial thing. Communication is crucial. At the highest level, communication is crucial. The best tool you have is your pings. If you can ping accurately what you want to do ahead of time, you're going to be able to push players into your ideas. Don't be, don't ever be stuck in the past. Don't use the chat to explain or talk about anything that has already occurred. Always talk about what comes next. It is crucial. And the same way you should use your pings. Use your pings to signal what you want to do next. And if you want to find a champion to play, do this magical trick, okay? Do this magical trick, okay? Do this magical trick, boom! Lol tier list, wow, I am an AD carry player, wow! I am going to, I need a champion to play. Wow, Vayne is too hard for me to play because I am gold. So I'm gonna play Kartus and Ash. Great, now we have champions to play rock and roll, you know? Rock and roll. After watching your interview with Wonder, how do you think your approach to coaching pro players has evolved over the years? 
I think that um, I think the th the main thing that you learn, right, is um, I think I think the biggest thing that has like evolved is just my knowledge about the game. I think that is the thing that has evolved uh, the most, and the precision of analyzing what is important. You know, it's all about just finding more and more efficiencies in everything that you do. In everything that you do, you want to find more efficiency in terms of how you review, in terms of how you scrim, in terms of how you prepare, in terms of how you, you know, work. You know, it's all about improving on my own personal philosophy. So at the core, I believe in the same things and I echo my personality in my work, but it's all about just finding more and more efficiencies in everything. If you were to come back as a coach, which player would you like to work with? You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of players that I would like to work with, you know. It's like, uh, I think, people that I've already mentioned. Like, I, I don't want to talk about it too much because some are still on the contract and it would, you know, be a very, very strange situation. But, you know, some that uh, are not as busy right now. It's like Wunder, Bwipo, two players that I would love to work with. Jizuke, you know, these are players that I would love to work with, you know. Like, this is these are very, very easy players for me to reference to that players that I believe can be the best in, in, in their position and have uh, the mindset and the capability to compete against uh, uh, world's levels players. And what about coaching makes you love it so much and what motivates you for that aspect? I, I, I think that the brotherhood that you can create and the bond that you can create uh, with, with others in, in trying to pursue a common goal, I think the beauty in that, uh, I think not, nothing really matches it. I think that you create memories together that are going to last a lifetime and you know people always think say you know i i i i i uh i miss the good times well for me when i'm competing and working together with the team i feel like i am in the good times you know i'm actively there in the trenches with my boys and you have this opportunity to impact every aspect of performance which basically coaching becomes this idea of responsibility where the measurement of responsibility is whatever you want it to be. And you can take responsibility and ownership over everything. And in that you'll find opportunities to have great impact on individuals that will echo and tremor in esports. As you go. When you work together with a player, you have an opportunity to maybe impact him in some way and to unleash his true potential for him to have an even greater impact on the whole ecosystem. And there's a lot of beauty in that for me. And I think at the core of it all, it's competition. I love breaking other teams. I love it because I have so much respect for the game. I have so much respect for the game. I have so much respect for the game that I know that my competitors, they have tried to outwork me, but they couldn't do it. And I love that part of it. We are faced with the same circumstance and the same goal and we have defeated you. Victory has defeated you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I recently watched The Dark Knight and I'm completely infatuated by all of the beautiful quotes of Bane. Victory has defeated you. Uh, would you be interested in coaching KC in the future? Yeah, I've already said this. We've already answered this. What watches do you currently own and what do you think of buying? I don't like talking about this. I, I, I really... Like, it's like I, I do it for my personal... I do it for my own personal reasons, right? I, I do it for my own personal reasons and I don't like to flaunt it. Like I like to invest in watches that will maintain value. For me, it's like an investment instrument that I can enjoy physically, uh, which is cool for me, and it's uh, my side interest. 
But I think it's very vain to like flaunt wealth. I don't really believe in showing off your cars and showing off wealth. I don't really give a shit about this. It might sound funny coming from me. It's like people always assume that I have a shit ton of money because I have some nice suits and so forth. But I take care of my suits. And for me, these are investments in in me and what I love. And it's like I have spent a very limited amount of money. Uh, and when I buy a clothing piece, when I buy a clothing piece, it is a clothing piece that I am in love with. And then I will maintain it for so many years and take care of it for so many years. And for me, that's better than buying something cheap. And that's what it is. You know, it's like I, I buy clothing items that are maybe more expensive, but for me, I save money doing so. What about those Pokemon cards you showed off? Also investment instruments. Also in line with something that I love. It's like I'm very intrigued by the Pokemon card market. So I follow it and I pay attention to it and I've invested in it. It's like I don't buy a lot of stuff, but when I buy stuff, I buy some good ass stuff. <laughs> That's I, the, the main, the, the one thing that I like to spend a lot of money on is food. I don't like buying good food. This is that's me. That's what I spend money on. All right. LSE without you coaching doesn't feel right, brother. I feel that. Yeah, I feel that. Did you create a video in which you discuss potential roster change you'd like to see? So you could sort of, oh, I feel like this is something that uh, should happen later. It's like we currently have the World Championship. I don't think it's super interesting right now. Good food is overrated. I think that uh, your definition of good is personal to you because good is extremely subjective. But good can be healthy and clean food and... It's like this, the, the, the difference between eating some fucking steroided chicken uh, that is the cheapest and free range chicken uh, that is maybe three times more expensive. The difference in flavor and how you feel after you eat it is immense. It's crazy what big of a difference it is. Hi Amaro, if every other international competition win won by Asian teams, why European teams don't copy their aggressive style? Will you relax to catch up on Asia? Have a great day. We have we've talked about this extensively today, so I don't want to open up that conversation, but I don't think that uh, you're not gonna run as fast as Usain Bolt by trying to copy how he runs. <laughs> because the way he runs is specifically designed for his body. <laughs> so you need to make some new shoes or run backwards or do something that is going to make you into an outlier. Not a question, so I want to say love you, welcome, best of luck in anything you would do in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, when the sack merch? I'm honestly looking into it. I'm looking into it, but this is going to happen. You know, I had this crazy idea. I had this crazy idea, guys. I had this crazy idea. I'm like drawing logos. I, don't, I haven't drawn this logo yet. Yeah, of course. It's like running technique is, is, is very important. Right? So basically we have a Y. Okay? Wait, how did I imagine this? Now I have another Y. No, I, bro, I, I, I was. Bro, I had, I, I was, I dreamt the logo in my mind. But I can't remember it anymore. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know. So it's a, it's a Y, another Y, and there was like a sack with a heart. Bro, I don't fucking remember, bro. 
something like this, bro. <laughs> I've lost my mind, bro. <laughs> I didn't write down my idea. <laughs> oh, man. All right. I hope you're not retiring. No way. <laughs> Never. Would you rather say a coach is taking an active pass LEC? I would have talked about this. Hot topic is potential upcoming KC of LEC. With the extension of EU to MEA, we can expect big LEC in the future. How many teams with these changes are there for LEC, by your opinion? I worry about diluting the, the, the spots in the LEC. I don't think you can extend uh, the, the... I don't think that you can expand the franchising anymore. You can't. You can't. What's your takeaway from one year backseat co-stream with the boys? I, I think my takeaways are more in uh, my own personal reflections. It's like, keep in mind, most of the time when, when we are co-streaming, it's like we are also putting on a show. We're not trying to like be as meticulous as, as we would be in competition and in professional life. We're also trying to put on a show, mixing it with our knowledge. So it's very, very different. Very, very different. How would you make a Western team more competitive? We talked about it. I still believe to this day your variation of Fnatic squad was meant for greater things. If it wasn't for some unforeseen circumstances or unusual hiccups, you could have scored more that than than one title. If you could have changed one thing to do to, to better the team, what would it be? If I could change one thing about the most recent uh, Fnatic Rose of 2022 is that we would start two months earlier. We would start two months earlier. If we did, I think that we would have won titles. If we started two months earlier and I had... And if I started, if we started two months earlier, we would have won titles. We were always lagging behind. And that was the biggest problem. The biggest issue of us. And I would never, ever let that happen again. Especially in the current format. So if I had to pick one thing, of course, there's a lot more things on top of that, but... Having coach in both LCK and LEC, what are the main difference between the regions? I think just the standard is way higher. You know, it's so easy to work hard in a Korean team because the air in the gaming room is so intense that if you don't work hard, then you're such a piece of shit that everyone's going to notice. And there is something about peer pressure that is so extremely effective. And I think that having... Having... Everybody culturally aligned in terms of where you're from is also super, super beneficial because it's like Korean teams, it's like in Korean culture, it's like older, older players take care of younger players and there's a natural like bonding experience and a brotherhood that is built up. So already we have two things in place that you have to work hard to put in place in the LEC, which is work ethic and also the brotherhood and the care between one another. And then comes the solo queue. And then comes the drive that comes from the honor of representing the LCK and what it means to represent the LPL. You know, all of these things add up. And then there's the solo queue practice. And there's the great players that have won the World Championship. You practice against them, you look up to them. You have role models, right? Think about this, right? Why are there many Polish junglers? Maybe this is anecdotal evidence, but... Why are there many Polish junglers? Because of Jankos. How many junglers have looked up to Jankos and say, yo, that's, look, Jankos has carved something out and I want to become that, I'm going to pursue that, right? Why are there so many Danish mid laners? Because Froggen, every fucking Danish mid laner looked up to Froggen and said, yo, I want to play Anivia and I want to be better than this guy, right? How many players have come how many players have has the idea of Faker created? I think every fucking mid laner that is worth their salt at some point looked up to fucking Faker. And those things matter. Those things really, really matter.
Uh, we already talked about this. What's the color? Blue. Has Coastream with the sack change your approach to what lies in the future? Uh, partially. I think we covered this uh, extensively. Simple one for me was your biggest coaching regret. Well, 2016 in summer, it's not, it's not really a regret, right? It's just that it's like professionally, I did a very poor job, I'd say. 2016 summer, I fell deeply, deeply in love. Deeply, deeply in love. And it's not a regret at all, because I am together with this person to this date. And I have the intention of spending the rest of my life with Alena. But I was so, so deeply in love that I let it distract me big time in terms of my work with the boys at the time. And I had to really, really work uh, hard to figure out a better work-life balance. My conclusion was, yo, Elena, I'm competing now. You're not going to see me for the next four months. And she supports me. That was my conclusion. Because there's no work-life balance. There's no work-life balance when you're competing, by the way. <laughs> my two years in Fnatic... I didn't see Elena, Elena at all, but she supported me. And that's a keeper right there, 100%. But biggest coaching regret is what I mentioned before, you know? Uh, it's just that, you know, last year, the, the fact, well, it's, it's not really a regret because we couldn't, we couldn't. There was like contract issues, we couldn't start earlier. You know? It's just that the bottom line is I don't have any regrets. I'm trying to think of it, but I just, I just, just not how I function. I don't have regrets. It's like everything I've done has led me to this point, and I'm very proud to be at this point. And I'm, pr I'm proud of the mistakes I've made because they've helped me grow. I'm proud of the hardships. I'm proud of what I've accomplished. I'm here for a reason, you know? So, it's like, what I'm trying to think of my big, biggest regrets is like, there's, there's nothing. I just, this is not how I work, you know? Do you think you could have worked harder? <sighs> thing is, every year I coach, I find a way to work harder. It's like, last year in Fnatic, I worked my fucking ass off, by the way. I was... In the office first, left the office last. If I could, I would sleep on the office floor. But it just wasn't allowed. It just wasn't allowed. It's just about working more effective. I've never had a hard time working hard. I worked hard my whole life. Bro, when, when, when I... For example, season one and two, what I, with the lengths I had to go through to play League of Legends, you guys would have no idea. I lied to my school constantly. I played in school. I had to work with my father uh, after school. I needed to keep my grades up. And otherwise, I wouldn't have internet. I wouldn't be able to play. I had to go sleep at certain hours. I played on a shitty fucking MacBook that I converted to Windows 20 FPS, grinding to climb the top 10 ladder, burning my testicles and my thighs because it was on my la lap and I was laying in bed playing like this because I was hiding from my father that didn't allow me to be awake. Because I had a dream. And at the time, I slept two hours a day, bro. Two hours a day. Two hours a day I slept. But I didn't care, bro. Someone like like esports, I was I was so infatuated. I was so infatuated by the idea of esports and competing that nothing could hold me back. Nothing. All right, this is something we talked about. A bit late, but would you consider the coaching an LPL team? Yes, I would love to. I would love to. I would love to. I would love to. I would love to coach in the LPL. I would love to coach in the LCK. I would love to coach in the LEC. That's where my, my headspace is at, right? It's like, I have certain rules for the teams that I would coach in the LEC. 
But the LPL and LCK, I'm lenient on the, more lenient on those rules because I would use that opportunity to, to grow. Does the language barrier become an issue? Well, issues are just issues until you solve them. And I like to throw myself in scenarios where I'm met with an issue. I, like, I love to solve problems. Your thoughts about Blue Stars and really can change something or not that much? I think it's interesting. I think Kote's project here to, to, to make a tournament for younger players is super interesting. Super interesting. I like it. I'm curious to, to follow that. We already talked about this extensively. Would you be open to co coach outside of the top four regions? Very, very tough to, to convince me of doing that. But the same rules apply as, as in the LEC. Have you stopped at 102 Boulevard de Sebastopol? I didn't stop at this place. I don't know what this is. Is this the Vive? The Vitality Vive? Yamaro, will you coach a team with Upset Hilly and Buipo next year? We must know if this is something on the cards. <laughs> Not sure, man. What's your motivation to continue coaching and working in this industry? Um, on my end, I think that we are pioneers in an industry that is very young. And we have an opportunity to shape so much. And being at the forefront of that is a privilege. So I'm... And at the same time, I just love League of Legends. And if I stopped, I would have, I would have so much useless knowledge. I'm going to be working at a McDonald's. No, I'm kidding. If I stop working with League of Legends today, I would become a firefighter. Uh, that's where I'm at. I would become a firefighter and then I would study to become a veterinarian or a clinical psychologist while I work as a firefighter. That would be like my mission. I think that I would make a great firefighter. Not much of a question, but bless you for posting your podcast on Spotify. It really makes the one hour drive to work less of a pain. Do these homies not know that YouTube can do the same thing? Bro, the reason I don't upload them on Spotify, I'm, I'm going to tell you this, because it gives me absolutely nothing. It gives me nothing. No metrics, no numbers, no money, no anything, nothing. And that's what pains me about Spotify. I cannot show it to sponsors. I cannot show it to anything. It doesn't give me anything. You can't have YouTube and Google Maps at the same time. I can tell you, you're using the wrong YouTube app. If you don't want to buy a YouTube Premium, there are apps that um, allow you to pop it out, mate. And do audio only. You just need to explore your phone a little bit more, blood. Alright, I'm just scrolling through because I think it's time to wrap up. Why is there a comma between your future and KC? <laughs> Do you get scared commenting on players or orgs in case of burning bridges? No, I think this is a good question. Uh, I don't. I don't get scared because my opinion needs to come from a place of honesty. And if if I can't justify that for, like, if I can't justify that in front of the player too, then why the fuck am I saying it in the first place? There's a very clear separation that occurs when we just talk about the game, we are talking about only the performance within the game. It is not personal at all. Even though the player might view it as personal because their personality is very aligned and their self-worth is aligned with their performance, in reality, it's not personal. I made this example with Ebi. The Ebi story is a very intriguing one, very interesting one. 
right? Ebi left a very comfortable life in Japan where he had everything. He had, he had the world by his palm in Japan, winning the league, being the goat of the league, and basically moved away from his family, moved away from his comfort to go to the LEC. He risked it all for the slight chance of more. And I was excited to see Ebi play in the LEC, right? The personal side of Ebi is very, very interesting. But his gameplay was fucking awful. His gameplay was atrocious. His performance was terrible. So, for example, here, the person in the chat, Sensible02, yeah, I really don't like how hard I would dominate flamed him because of that. You don't get it. You don't understand, right? You don't understand the point that I'm making. It is... I have respect for the individual that is Abby and the person that is Abby and the story that is Abby, right? He came to Europe... Very challenging to adapt to the environment, complete different country, complete everything, complete different. But when it comes to performance, these things don't fucking matter. Don't, no one fucking cares when it comes to performance, because it's not personal. You can have sympathy for the personal story, the, 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 the challenges that this person faces. But he was fucking bad. I think that you're wrong there, Sensible O2, because I think that his performance across the whole year was quite terrible. Quite terrible. And now Dominate is a very, very smart individual. He doesn't flame anybody for no reason, because when he goes hard, he is ready to tell you exactly why. He's ready to tell you exactly why. Dom is very, very smart. He doesn't flame people for no reason, because he would put himself at great risk for doing so. He's ready to back up everything. And he's waiting. He's waiting, waiting, waiting for someone to call him out for the shit that he says. Because he got, he's got he got ammunition for days. Your outfits do look immaculate. How did you learn how to dress yourself? Only by what you felt comfortable with? Did you educate yourself specifically on that topic? I think that I have a great eye for color palettes. I think I have a great eye for color palettes. I think that's crucial. I have a great eye for color palettes. What makes sense on a color sense. And additionally, as I mentioned before, I only buy things that I fall in love with. That I care for and I take care of. You know? And... An additional part... An additional element of this is that you need to buy clothes that fucking fit. I know there's baggy wear and so forth and these things matter, but... You know? You get me. If you 1v1 Gilius in real life, who would win? Bro, I weigh more than Gilius. And I, like, I have tripled the reach. I'm 195, bro. I'm 195. In your career, did you ever have an opportunity that you turned down and later on regretted not taking? So basically, back in season two, the thing is, I might be remembering this completely wrong. It may be like simple conversation. I really overblew it in my mind. Right? I maybe overblew it completely in my mind. 
But I had conversations with Peke and Shushe. Well, Peke at the time about joining Fnatic. But I was not allowed to move out of my home and leave school. And that was a necessity. And I'm not saying I would have been invited over Soaz. I'm not saying that. Because maybe I remember it completely wrong. And maybe I just, you know, overcooked. But I remember this moment. And maybe I remember it wrong. Because keep in mind, this was fucking 11 years ago. You get me? So maybe that moment. But in the end, once again, I mentioned before, there's no regrets. Because maybe if I took that chance, maybe maybe my life would have been completely fucked. Maybe I would have been kicked off a fanatic after one year. And then my life would be ruined because I jumped out of school. I answered this question sensible. Bro, what are these questions sensible? You fucking spammed. Are you going to pursue coaching or decide that you're too washed to manage it? <laughs> my pronouns are kill them. Oh my lord. How fucking cringe are you, bro? It's like, you know, if people put their pronouns in their fucking bio, it is what it fucking is. If you put your, like, if you put pronouns to prove a point to go against the other pronoun homies... I think I think that's like another level of fucking cringe that you achieve. That you achieve. I don't know, bro. It's really easy. Live and let live. When 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 other people's live when other people live and you have an issue, bro, you're fucking done. Uh, nevertheless, guys, I think that's a great place to start. It's a great place to end. I mean, uh, thank you so much for watching.